Hi there, I'm Mark Icero, and this is the Highlighter Podcast. Hello and welcome to the 30th episode of the Highlighter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast is an opportunity for us to talk about the best articles and podcast episodes on race, education, and culture. And this month, my co-host Anne and I are doing a deep dive on the very important topic of college. We all know that's extremely important, not just right now as college acceptances go out, but just in general for our students and for ourselves and really for our society. And so last week, what Anne and I did is that we sort of framed the issue in podcast episode number 29, and we hope that you'll take this journey with us and also give us your opinions about this topic over the course of the month. And this week is on assignment. She's doing some reporting for next week's show. And this week, we're going to center in on the article of the month, which is Who Gets to Graduate by Paul Tuff. This article appeared in the newsletter in number 132, as well as in the New York Times a few years ago. And I'm very excited to talk about it today and right now to announce our guest. Our guest today is Rosie Leva, and she is a third grade teacher in the Bay Area. She's also a first generation college student. And so when she read this article, she reached out to me and she said, Mark, this article resonated with me. I would love to talk about it more. And so we had a wonderful conversation that I can't wait to be sharing with you. Rosie's a wonderful person, wonderful educator, wonderful reader, and it's going to be wonderful for you to listen to what she has to say. Let's get right to that interview. Hi, Rosie. How are you? Hi, Mark. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for being on the show. Can you please introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. My name is Rosie Leva. I'm a third grade teacher at Cox Academy in East Oakland, and I am a first generation college graduate. And it's wonderful to have you, especially with our college month, our deep dive on college. But even before we get that, I before we get there, um, you're a big reader, and so can you say a little bit about that? Sure. Um, For me, I feel like reading has been um, an important part of my life, and I think in terms of my childhood, it's kind of what what saved me. I was able to kind of escape the trauma around me and poverty and all of that by reading. Um, And now as an adult, I just feel like it's part of my um, self-care to make sure that I'm reading. Um, So I make sure that I'm reading some fiction and some education-related books, but then also some nonfiction that's not education-related. Right. It's good to have a variety. Um, Is there anything right now that you're reading that you would recommend to the audience? Um, I'm reading Daring Greatly, uh, How the Courage to be Vulnerable Transforms the Way We Live, Love, Parent, and Lead by Brene Brown. And it's been really insightful so far just thinking about um, what vulnerability means and what it doesn't mean and how we can you know, build shame resilience, which I want to talk a little bit more about later today. Yeah, that sounds good. And plus, you're also a wonderful subscriber to the highlighter itself and to the podcast. So I want to thank you for that, too. Um, What is it about the highlighter that makes you open it up every week? I think for me, I can, it can be overwhelming to have access to so much information. And I think you do such a great job of curating articles that are relevant and interesting and insightful. So I feel like every time I open it, I it's relevant to my experience. And even if it's not, I can learn something from it. So I, I, I think you just do a great job of curating the material. That's very kind. Thank you. Um, and one of the articles that you sort of reached out about was this, this month's article, um, who gets to graduate by Paul Tuff. We're doing a deep dive on college. And this is sort of like the lead article of the month. And you reached out and you said, Hey, I want to talk about this article. And it resonated with you. Um, How come what resonated um, with you the most? Yeah, I think I think this article is so deeply personal. Um, 
I think oftentimes when I'm reading some articles, there's some part of it that I can resonate with, but I felt like throughout this article, there were so many things where I was like, oh, I experienced that. I experienced that. Oh, I wonder if this could have helped me in terms of the interventions I would try. So I just felt like I I just had this a deep insight into um, the girl's name. The student's name mentioned is Vanessa Brewer into what Vanessa Brewer was experiencing and in terms of the interventions as well that were tried. Yeah, for the folks who haven't read it yet, I definitely recommend. And um, the main character of the article, it revolves around this young woman named Vanessa, and she's a pretty good student in high school. And then she goes to UT Austin. um, And then she struggles, especially in the first semester. You went to UCSC. And, and was it difficult? Was it challenging right from the beginning? How was that first semester for you? Um. I, well, the first day was really scary being dropped off. I was 17 years old and being dropped off. But after that first day, I, it was great uh, for me. I felt like I was finally independent and I connected with people right away. And I also connected with um, stu- the student government right away and with the other student organizations. I connected with Mecha. Um, and our uh, SUA Student Union Assembly. So I was able to take on some leadership roles right away. Um, And in terms of the academics, it wasn't, I mean, it was challenging, but it wasn't something that I wasn't expecting. So for me, I felt like I belonged and I felt like I was able to complete the work. I think what was challenging for me was having this pressure of making sure that I succeeded at all costs. Yeah. And where do you think that pressure came from? I think for for my family, and I'll speak specifically about my family, I'm the first person in my immediate and extended family to graduate from college. Um, and you know, both my parents have, um, only an elementary school education. My grandmother never learned how to read. So just thinking about historically being able to go to a college for our family meant disrupting hundreds of years of colonization and oppression. And it just like going to college and graduating from college, I think in the article, they, uh, they specifically, uh, address it as um, like being able to reach the prize or this prize being able to do that. And for my family, that's what it represented. And I think it represented that for me. I can remember specifically the day that I got my acceptance letter to UC Santa Cruz. And the first thought that went through my head was, I have a future now. Wow. And like, it makes me get really teary eyed, but I just felt like I finally can be someone and it, it just like my self worth was deeply tied to to graduating from college. So, did it manifest like a nervousness that was just there at all times? Um, did it come and go? Um, how would you describe this just almost burden um, that you had that you sort of had to show and you had to succeed? It was I just couldn't show weakness, and I couldn't. I felt like I couldn't ask for help. I, I mean, for one thing, I didn't know what resources I had access to. I know that I was part of EOP, which is the Educational Opportunity Program. And the only real benefit that I actually um, like engaged in was having preferential housing, and it was guaranteed housing. But in terms of the college advising and all these other added benefits, I didn't really know I had access to them. Um, and I also felt kind of weak asking for help and, you know, asking my parents, you know, telling my parents that I was having these thoughts wasn't helpful at all because, you know, at that point I was 17 years old and it was just a huge struggle for my dad to even like give me permission to go to college, um, because I was technically still 17. And according to him, I needed to be, because I'm a, I'm a girl. I need to actually stay home. 
um, and not go away and be on my own. So like that was a challenge. And I, I didn't feel like I could turn to my parents to actually have these discussions. It was like, I need to succeed, if not what they've been saying about this being really difficult or challenging or like I shouldn't do it is going to come true. And it, it just felt like I, I didn't have, I couldn't ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. And that's similar, I think, to what Vanessa experiences in the article. But it is interesting to contrast a little bit about your experience versus hers. Um, she didn't feel like she really belonged, especially after that first initial uh, academic setback. And then you always felt like you could do the work. And yet there was this still this pervasive feeling that you you couldn't be weak. Um also, it did sound like you had government and you had other programs and Mecha mm-hmm. and a good social network, right. and yet that wasn't really enough. Was there a point in one of the years at UCSC where it sort of became a little bit too much? Yeah, it was my sophomore year, and I was also going through um, like coming out, so that was something else that I was also experiencing and having some serious mental health um, issues going on and also not knowing what resources I had. So it was really my sophomore year where I just kind of started unraveling and I just was, I just felt out of control. Like I no longer had control over everything around me. Yeah. And you, and did you just totally feel alone and isolated at that point? Definitely. And I started withdrawing from my friends. I started withdrawing from all of my organizing activity. Um, and I ended up um, being put on academic probation. And I actually, I think I, it was, I think I took off like two semesters, no, two quarters, I believe. And then I actually ended up going back again. And I thought I was on the right track. And then at the very end, I actually went to UC Santa Cruz for four years and I didn't finish the last quarter. So I didn't actually end up graduating from UC Santa Cruz. You know, I've heard that story so many times of people who go so far all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. And then there's something about finishing that is like the hardest thing is to, to finish up those last units. Yeah. Yeah. A good story, though, is that you did end up graduating. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, So several years later, so it it did take several years, I ended up enrolling at Western Governors University. It's a nonprofit um, online university. It's based out of um, Salt Lake City, Utah. So I was able to finish with my, um, graduate with my bachelor's degree, and I was able to get both of my teaching credentials, my uh, multiple subject credential, and my special education credential at the same time. Yeah, I want to hear more about that. Um, But one more question that I had about um, the article Mm -hmm. is the article was talking about all these interventions, Mm -hmm. um, especially at the University of Texas, that seemed to work uh, around issues of confidence around ability as well as uh, belonging. And I wanted to get your sort of like your opinion on these programs and whether you think they would have worked for you. Um, One of them was sort of like uh, a program to offer additional support on the difficult classes, Mm -hmm. but not to sort of say that they were remedial in any way. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was pretty pretty easily just talking about fixed versus growth mindset and then and then helping students with sort of messaging and what what are your what's your opinion on either of these to start off i don't know if those would have helped me necessarily i think my most of my con- concerns were around my mental health and not knowing how to navigate that but i do think in looking at the interventions that were that seemed that they were successful um, at UT, they both involved, it wasn't just the messages that were that students were getting. It was actually that they were, in my opinion, that they were being delivered by their peers. So right. the messages around um, ability was delivered by peers. The message around belonging was also 
delivered by peers. And it was peers actually talking about their own experience. And I think for me, what what resonated with me in terms of um, a lot of the thinking I've been doing around um, like shame, because for me, um, as a when I dropped out of college, I felt so much shame. And even in college, when I felt like I couldn't ask for help, I just felt so much shame, like I should have it together. Like I shouldn't need anything, I should have it together. And there was so much shame involved in that. And in thinking about um, Brene Brown and how she um, uh, defines shame, she says it's uh, shame is the fear of disconnection. Um, And I just think by having the peers actually name the thoughts that the students will also experience, I feel like that takes some of the shame out of having those thoughts. And I think that's the power in the in the intervention, not necessarily in the message itself, but it's that their peers who are saying, I had these same issues. Like this is not, it's normal to feel this way. You feeling this way is not abnormal. And I think for me, that's something that I've just come to realize more and more that my experience actually is fairly common. And I didn't know that, like looking at the statistics of who gets to, who actually graduates it's just like, oh, I'm actually not, it's not that uncommon. My experience is not that uncommon. And that was a huge surprise for me. Yeah, that's a brilliant point. Whenever I talk to folks who graduated in four years, maybe a long time ago, um, the statistics are very shocking because I think that they've been hidden. And if we just actually get the statistics out there, the reality out there, um, we find out that the pathways are are very common, um, especially with folks who are first in their family to graduate from college. So yeah, it is very interesting how you came to realize that you were like you were not uncommon and you did what you needed to do and you ultimately graduated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um I want to know more about mental health though at college and also more about shame because it seems like if you were able to restructure the college experience especially for first generation students that you would focus on that. Can you share a little bit more about that? Oh, this is a really challenging question because I think I could go in multiple directions. And I think like the, the area of mental health, I just feel like that's a bigger issue than just like college, just in terms of the stigma around our mental health as a society and also culturally. Um, so I think there's these like bigger like dimensions that I think would need to be addressed. Um, But I think just thinking about my own experience at UC Santa Cruz, accessing mental health, I felt like I was, in order to access it, I had to be in crisis. To access services, I had to be in crisis. And then in terms of like therapy, I could only have a few sessions a year. And when you're experiencing crisis after crisis, that's not sufficient. So I think having some, you know, comprehensive mental health services for students would be helpful, especially I don't have um, rates around depression. But I know from reading that I've done how depression is so rates are so high in college campuses. Um, So I would just like advocate for comprehensive mental health. And also thinking about um, like medical leaves of absence and thinking about mental health and being able to um, access medical leaves of absence. Like I didn't know I had access to that when I was in college. So I think if I knew I had access to that, then I could actually take a leave of absence and not drop out. Yeah, absolutely. It just seems like that there is a pattern of maybe not enough resources or comprehensive resources, but even when the resources are there, it seems that certain students know about them or have access versus certain students do not. I'd love to talk to you more about after you graduated, you got into education. And the first step is that you became a high school learning specialist. Um, But now you work at third grade. So can you um, talk a little bit about your journey there? Sure. Um, So 
Before I became a learning specialist, I was actually an instructional assistant um, for four years at Impact Academy in Hayward. And it's a college prep high school. Um, And at that point, when I first started, I hadn't graduated from college. And that was a huge point of shame for me. Like, I'm supporting students to go and to college and graduate from college. And I myself haven't graduated from college. And I, I had a lot of shame around that. And I didn't want to talk about it. And I never lied about it. I just said I went to UC Santa Cruz. I never said I graduated from UC Santa Cruz. But there was, there was a lot of shame around that. But at the same time, there was a lot that drove me to go back to school to get my credentials. Um, so it was after our graduate, our founding class at Impact Academy, after they graduated, um, that I was like, I'm going back to school and I'm going to go to college too and finish up. Um, so it just felt like it drove me back to school and it motivated me back to school. And originally when I got, when I went back to school to get my BA and my two credentials. I was really only looking for the special education credential, but I had to also get the multiple subject credential. So it wasn't something that I was really thinking much about. Um, But then after I got my credentials and I was in uh, a learning specialist for two years, I just was finding that I you know, I find a lot of joy in working one-on-one with students and having that connection with students. And I was just finding like I was spending a lot of my time doing paperwork and not as much time working with students. And, you know, the paperwork aspect of writing IEPs is valuable and it's important. It wasn't what was bringing me joy, though. Um, So I had to think about, well, what are my what are my options? And I had this other credential, which was my multiple subject credential. um, And I decided I'm going to I'm going to make the change. And I think part of that motivation, too, was thinking about seeing some of my students in, at the high school level and just sometimes thinking, like, how did you get here without, and I, I will name this as somewhat deficit thinking and thinking about how did you get here and not know how to be able to do all of these things. Because a lot of my students also came with a lot of great strengths that I celebrated and celebrate. But I also wanted to get really start working on the liter, really thinking about literacy um, and thinking about how can I reach kids sooner and try to do more with developing their literacy. And that's also what motivated me and kind of really convinced me to start teaching at a lower grade. Yeah, that sounds great. And now you're at third grade Mm -hmm. and you're in East Oakland Mm -hmm. and you're working on literacy and college almost as the same thing. Is that accurate? Like you're sort of seeing them similarly? Yeah, I think, um, you know, this month uh, in March, our school is um, kind of launching a college awareness, college going culture kind of initiative that my colleague Caitlin Dobson and I have been leading. And I've been thinking a lot about um, like, what does it mean to develop a college going culture Um, and looking at some resources and it's around um, like exposure, having high expectations and also engaging, you know, all family members. And I think there's different parts of that, that we are targeting in terms of the high expectations part for me in the classroom that's exactly what it means. It means holding high expectations for students while at the same time supporting them to to meet those expectations because students will rise to whatever expectation you set for them, whether it's low or high, that's what they will reach. So last year, we received the Next Generation Learning Challenge grant from the Rogers Foundation. Um, so through that grant, we were able to develop a personalized learning prototype to address reading instruction. Um, so we've been able to build our students' um, agency around their own reading. And what that looks like in my classroom is that students are developing, um, well, we're collaborating to develop reading goals for them. Um, so it's not just, I want to advance to this level, but it's more of some students are focusing on making inferences based on character feelings. Other students are focusing on choosing just right books because they're struggling with reading engagement. 
Other students are focusing on their fluency and reading with expression. Other students are focusing on retelling and summarizing. So students are really focusing on the areas that they need. And I just feel like my students are so much more aware of when they're meeting those goals and also thinking about well, this is where I need help now and thinking about developing goals for themselves. And it's really exciting to see. At the third grade level, um, are students seeing that reading is joyful and are they also seeing that it has power or is that something that you have to message? It's something that I have to message and that I'm really purposeful of making sure that I do that. I think, um, especially the joyful part, because for me, that was, for me, it's reading is such an important part of my life. And I just wish other people were, it just enjoyed reading as much as I do. So for my students, when they're selecting books, there's two things I tell them in terms of, you know, making sure it's a just right book for them. Um, One is, you know, can you understand it? And we have, you know, strategies to figure out whether, you know, they can understand the text. But then the second question is, are you having fun? Are you enjoying it? And if you can't answer those questions, then it's probably not, you know, the right book for you. And just really thinking about having reading be fun for them. So I've done, you know, many lessons around how you should read yourself awake and you should feel like you're in a movie and like it's a 3D movie and you can see things flying at you and you can hear things and smell things. And um, I just really want reading to come alive for them. Um, and I I actually have a, uh, a little book club at school with my third graders um, during lunch on Wednesdays. So students can choose to come and share what they're reading and we just make recommendations. And I have about 10 kids, so a little less than half of my class um, that shows up for book club to talk about books. And it's just it's exciting to see. It's so exciting because if they have that joy and if they also have the fluency and interest, then they're just going to, they're just going to succeed and they're going to be happy and proud and they're going to love reading. And then it'll get, they'll get through those critical middle grades and high school grades where we know, we know that reading plummets and we know that interest plummets. And then what we see is that a lot of teachers may not be as prepared and equipped to really focus on reading as you are at the third grade level. Yeah. And I will say in third grade, students do have to take S back for the first time. So we are also looking at complex texts and looking at three reads protocols and doing some close reading as well in the third grade. So I think there's, there's a balance that has to be made of choosing of students having more of a choice in terms of what they're reading and like developing, having their own reading goals, but at the same time, also reading grade level text and having the skills to read closely and make inferences and, you know, answer text dependent questions and all of those things at the same time, which is challenging to do. Um, but in the third grade, it's it's the first year they see those SBAC questions. Yeah. And it is just extremely inspiring that you're there working with the third graders on their reading, as well as this college going culture, just because what you're doing and what you're working on in the third grade is really going to build on itself. Um, Do you feel like that you can see in some of your students that they might be able to get there in a way that maybe they'll be the first in their family to graduate? Absolutely. I I told my kids the first day of school and I tell the parents the first time I see them, I am not preparing. And this is my conversation to parents. I am not preparing your students for fourth grade. And then they all look at me like, what are you crazy? And then I say, I'm preparing your students so that in 10 years they are freshmen in college. Um, So that's like the first thing I tell them. And I talk about college all the time in my classroom so that when they're, even when I'm teaching math and I'm introducing variables, I tell them, you're going to see this in algebra in high school and you need that to get to college or all of these things. I'm constantly talking about it. And I see the students also saying like, I'm going to college. And it's just that initial one exposure, but also belief that they can do it, that I think can drive 
away some of the negative self-talk that we have. Yeah, I totally agree. And Rosie, I just want to thank you so much for sharing. I want to thank you so much for being on the show. And I have one final question for you. For somebody who is first in their family to be graduating from college, and let's say that this is the end of their um, first year at college, what would you say to them now so that they might uh, persist? I would say your self-worth is not tied to whether you graduate from college or not. Your self-worth exists just as is, as is you are worth it and advocate for yourself and believe in yourself and you will be okay. Thank you so much, Rosie. All right. Thank you. I want to thank Rosie yet again for being on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on the article, as well as your experiences as a first-generation college graduate. It was also inspirational to learn about your work with third graders to get them ready for college in just 10 years. So thank you again. Loyal listeners, I definitely want to hear from you, so don't be shy. You can give both of us, Ann and I, a call at 415-886-7475 and leave a message about today's show or about college in general. Go ahead and leave your viewpoints there and you might be on the show yourself. At this point, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and also be looking out for next week's episode. Anne is going to be centering in on This American Life's Three Miles. So go ahead and listen to that if you haven't done so already. Be looking for the newsletter this Thursday and then next Monday. Please listen in as Anne hosts next week's podcast episode. Have a great week.